contrite heart Humbly I surrender all that I am I want to learn from you Please draw me close to you Help me share your love and grace in all I do Lord, I come before you with contrite heart I surrender all that I am I want to learn from you Please draw me close to you Let me share your love and grace in all I do Oh Lord, transform me Change my heart completely to be more family matters. I choose to speak about children. Uh, this is a touchy and very important subject, but let me put it this way to begin. We have to understand that God's way of continuing the generation of human beings is through children. And if you put it another way, you can say children are nature's way of replacing itself. Uh, let me offer a word of prayer before we go into God's word. Loving God, we thank you ever so much for your goodness towards us. As I present, speaking about children today, I ask, oh Father, that you will help someone to have a clearer understanding as to who these little ones are that we grow up. Lead out. Grant me wisdom and understanding, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in the book, in First Samuel, chapter 1, uh, Hannah prays for a child. And in verse 24, it says, For this child... I prayed. This is Hannah speaking here. She says, For this child I prayed, and the Lord had given me my petition, which I asked of him. This is a mother talking. Now, let, let me just share the background into this. Uh, really, Hannah, as a mother, well, before that, she is a rival, or she has a rival, in the name of Penina. Elkina had two wives. One was barren, couldn't bring four children, and the other one could. Hannah, the lot was hers in terms of she could not bear children. This situation got so stressful for Hannah 
that she made a decision that she was going to pray and ask God for a child. She asked God specifically for a son. And God answered her and gave her that son. Now, she made a promise to God. And the promise was that if God gave her the son, she, Hannah, would return the son to God. In other words, let the son be a part of the priesthood. Uh, true to God's promise, or Hannah had that strong impression that God would answer her, and Eli the prophet also confirmed that. And so, you know, Eli the priest, uh, after confirming that, uh, at the correct time, the next year, Hannah did bring forth a child. Now, I give you all that background to say to whoever is listening uh, that children are a heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. you got to get that correct. you got to understand that. In other words, it is not just what we do. People like to think it's just what we do that cause children to come forth. But we must understand that the final decision or final permission to get children comes from God. That's important. Now, Hannah prayed for a child, and more people should pray for children instead of just marrying or just finding a partner and getting children. More people should pray for children. In other words, invite God into your family planning. Ask God to be a part of your family planning. Okay? Uh, the, the, the thing about it is that sometimes you hear women verbally abusing one another in terms of who can't get children. they verbally abusing that individual. Those words shouldn't come out of our mouths. We should understand that children are a heritage of the Lord. God it is who decides when a child will come into this world. Having said that, having said that, uh, one author said it is easier to build stronger children than to repair broken men. I want to say that again. And it's Frederick Douglass who said that. He said it is easier to build stronger children than to repair broken men. What he's emphasizing there is that educating and training children is extremely important. You can't just let them come into the world and grow up anyhow. No. If you do that, it's a sad mistake you're making because if they are not trained well, don't you expect that when they become adults, they would be well-trained adults. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, children also teach us. Many times we behave as if we teach children, but children also teach us. This is important. Uh, the story, I, I, somebody shared a story with me one time of a grandfather who came to this home and he was living there. He didn't have a place to live. And, you know, his hand was shaking, trembling, etc. I don't know what disease he had, but, you know, all of us, as we get old, all types of sickness and disease hit us. But, you know, the parents... Uh, when they saw him shaking at the breakfast table and sometimes spilling his milk and uh, his breadcrumbs dropping on the floor, the father, who was uh, the son, right? So his grandfather, son, and grandson, as, as well as uh, the boy's mother, uh, they are there. You know what decision the son made? He made a little table at the side and shifted the father from the regular breakfast table, put him at the side, and made a wooden bowl for him, because also the old man, when his hand shook, he caused the bowl to fall down and break and all of that. So he gave him a wooden bowl, shifted him from the regular breakfast table, and had him there. Uh, the grandson looked at the situation and one day the boy, uh, the father came home and saw the grandson with a chisel and a mallet and he was making something. So he asked the grandson what he was making and the grandson said, Daddy, I'm making a wooden bowl for you so that when you get old, 
like grandfather and you begin to shake and uh, you're breaking the bowl and you're spilling uh, your milk and all of that i'm going to give you the wooden bowl so that you will sit in the corner like what you did to grandfather with that the father realized that the boy was observing and he made a decision to take the grandfather if it is shaky and etc and let him still stay at the regular breakfast table so children they observe us they learn from us and that is why we have to be very careful about what we do in front of them uh, one author said don't worry that children never listen to you worry that they are always watching you i want to say that again don't worry that children never listen to you worry that they are always watching at you children prefer to do what we do they like to imitate they are great imitators it means therefore that we as parents we as adults we as teachers we as significant others you got to be careful what you do in front of children it means therefore that you have to follow christ and do only things that god allows or God is pleased that you uh, that you're doing these things and when you do what God is pleased with then as your children follow and imitate you it would be easy for them to end up doing the correct thing a child is a beautiful creation of God it means therefore that the home environment within which the child is growing we have to make it extremely comfortable for them and home must be a place where children can experience joy and happiness and love and laughter and peace you see when children have that type of history when children are growing up in a home where there's peace and laughter and happiness and joy and trust and honesty when they grow up that way these children will be growing up with high self-esteem they would be growing up understanding that they have a purpose within this world and they would they would grow up uh, with as individuals who see meaning in life very important they will grow up as individuals who have hope right we gotta we gotta have uh, that we gotta get that correct now i wanna i wanna I want to point out some things about children here. Uh, one, let me point out two things about children. One, what children are not. What children are not. Let me point out two things about that. We must see children as not our property. That's one. We must not see children as our property. But instead, we must see children as a gift that God has given to us that we cannot keep. I want to say that again. Children are not our property. But instead, we should see children as a gift from God that we cannot keep. In other words, one day, those children will grow up and become adults, go on their own, and they will leave our homes. So what do you do from birth to that time? You have to make sure you train them well so that when they leave your home, remember they're not your property, you can't keep them. When they leave your home, they can rightly represent biblical principles and also be able to make decisions uh, for themselves. Second thing, if you have a number of children, you must never make the decision that I will take one out of school to help to take care of the others. No, that's not wise. It's not good. You are depriving that child of a good education so as to take care of the others. But you must understand that children never ask to come into this world. You got to understand that. They never ask to come into this world. It means, therefore, whatever stress you have with them, you have brought them into the world. Hence, you need to make sure you try your best to take care of them. Now, I'm not criticizing anybody here. No, I'm not doing that. But I'm just pointing out, you should not take children out of school so that they can assist in, you know, earning money 
to mind the others. That is not right. I have come across children, even so recently, who, when they were growing up, they say, Sir, I never got a chance to complete school. And they grow up with this hurt and sometimes animosity and feelings of hatred against the parents because the parents took them out of school. Because remember, a good education is your freedom. A good education is a child's way of getting a chance to earn money and a child's way of getting a chance to change the status from perhaps somebody who is poor to somebody who is well off. So never make a decision or ad advice that a child should be taken out of school uh, to assist in terms of uh, the other children in the home. No, that's not a good decision. Now listen to this. We must also bear in mind, now this is a touchy issue, but I have to deal with it. Child molestation and sometimes sexual molestation. Now this is a touchy issue and people don't want to discuss it. But let me just... Uh, share a few sentences about child molestation. When a child is molested sexually, you got to understand that there is a scar on the child's mind for life. Definitely. But that is not all. Research has shown that many times the person who has molested the child is an individual, sometimes an adult, who is a family member, and that is sad. How does that happen? It happens because the individual who is a family member, they have access to the child, that's one. And also, the child has grown over the years to trust family members. So they don't think that a family member would want to, to, to molest them. So that because they trust the family member, this same family member can end up being the predator or the person who will molest the child. So what the child doesn't expect, the child is vulnerable, uh, is normal uh, with the family member, and this family member has taken advantage sometimes on the child. And that is why it is important for parents and guardians to be careful uh, about which family member is with their child. It's very, very important. Further, children sometimes attempt to tell us things and we want to shut them up. No, don't shut them up. Listen to the child. Hear the child out. Hear the story. Sometimes they are ashamed to tell you, but they want to tell you. And sometimes also you want to believe the family member instead of the child. You've got to understand, and very clear, parents, guardians, significant others, you've got to understand that children are honest and bluntly honest. And so when they have something to say to you, please give a listening ear and listen to what that child has to say. Very, very important. Uh, I, I, want that, I want that to come across very clear. Uh, now, children, uh, what a, a question I ask, and maybe I will go into answering it, but ponder this. What is the difference uh, between two children? One is a product of rape, and the other is a product of planned pregnancy. Question. What is the difference between these two children? One is a product of rape and the other is a product of planned pregnancy. Uh, now, uh, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going someplace with this. Now, somebody may say, the child who is a product of rape has no right to live. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Uh, or you may say, the child who is a product of planned pregnancy, that child should have all the facilities, educationally, academic, etc., psychologically, socially, to grow up well, but not the child who is as a result of rape. Now, let me interject here that a child is innocent. The child, even though this child is the, the, the product of rape, the child is innocent. And because the child is innocent, we should still uh, try our best, whoever 
persons can make those decisions. Not to see the child as an outcast, but to try your best to create the correct environment for learning, for growing up, so that this child can grow up well because the child is innocent. Very, very important. This child is innocent. And so, because this child is innocent, both children, the one who is the product of planned pregnancy and the one who is the product of rape, both of them should be given a fair chance to come into this world and to get a fair chance to be educated and to grow up. Very, very important. Uh, then, uh, so both uh, the needs should be met. Uh, they should get proper attention and, and both should be allowed to end up as normal adults, right? Very, very important. I'm just trying to be instructive here. Trying to be instructive here. Uh, then, uh, next scenario. Sometimes a girl gets pregnant at school and she has to drop out from school. And sometimes people say, uh, some Christian families say, uh, well, uh, this child has brought me shame and sometimes the parents want to put the child out uh, when the child is pregnant. We got to be careful with that type of attitude. Many things about that, but let me mention two. You know, sometimes parents who look down, by the way, I'm not saying it's right for the child to get pregnant at school. There's a, there's a time for pregnancy and the correct time is not when the child is, let's say, in secondary school. So I'm not saying it's right for that to happen then. But listen, it happened already. Let's say it's happened already. The parents should be very kind-hearted to that child. Further, some parents who are very cross and annoyed because this child got pregnant at school, you know, sometimes this same parent or parents, they became pregnant at school also. And it could be their parents didn't put them out. Now, when a teenage is at school and they got pregnant, that is the time when the child needs uh, that amicable home environment, uh, that place of comfort within the parents' home. That's not the time for you to put out that child. Yes, talk to them, scold them, explain to them consequences, etc. Yes, do all of that. But I am emphasizing here this morning, that's not the time for you to put out that child. No, that's not the time. That child is vulnerable. In fact, it's a child now who is going to bring forth a child. So it means, therefore, that you as parents, please try to be kind-hearted to that child who has switched roles and is now becoming a parent. Don't put them out. Let them see their responsibilities, yes, and shoulder some responsibilities. Further, if that child can get a chance to continue to further their education after they have brought forth that uh, little one, they should be allowed because that child now who has become a parent, that child now the need a completion of the education. Uh, now, there is something unfair that happens that I need to point out in terms of parenting and children. You know, uh, a girl may get pregnant at school and she had to drop out. But you know, it could be a boy at school is the father, but he gets a chance to continue his education. Uh, now, this is why we have to speak and explain clearly uh, to girls. Uh, society is more harsh to the girl who has gotten pregnant than to the boy who caused her to be pregnant. And that is why the girl needs to understand at school that she has to be very careful and steer clear of sexual activities when she is at school because of consequences, of course. Uh, now, let me, let, me, let me go on to something else. Sometimes I come across individuals who have said to me, uh, sir or pastor, you know, when I get to a certain age, if I don't get married and if I don't have a boyfriend as yet, uh, I may get to that stage where I have a good job, I can take care of a child. So because I get a good job and I can take care of a child, I may go with some gentleman just to get pregnant 
sleep with him, and after he's sure got pregnant, uh, get rid of him, get rid of that relationship, because I know that I can take care of that child all by myself. What is your view on that? Sometimes they ask me that. All types of questions they ask us as educators. And my view on that is this. When, when God constructed the family, let me put it that way, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and told them to be fruitful and reproduce, uh, bring forth children. Uh, the ideal is that a child should come into this world to parents, a husband and a wife, a male and a female. This is important. You see, it takes, well, first of all, let me say here, it takes an entire community to train a child. That's one way of looking at it. The other thing about that is we got to understand that it takes a father and a mother to really train a child well. When you as a mother alone try to train up a child and to be there for a child, there are a lot of things the child will lack. Uh, you, you see, God, God constructed the family in a way that both male and female should be there. Uh, now, what a mother could provide, a father can provide. And what a father can provide, a mother can provide. Children need both parents in their life. So if there is a female who is listening and saying, Hey, pass my biological clock is ticking. I want a child before, uh, before I get to such and such an age. And I can go uh, and get a child for somebody. I don't need him to mind the child. I can take care of that child all by myself financially. Please understand that you are robbing that child of an opportunity to grow up in a normal manner. Now, I'm a, I'm a parent, and I remember clearly that some things that my children will come and discuss with me, they wouldn't discuss with, with, with their mom. And some things they will discuss with the mom, they wouldn't discuss with me. Further, let me, let me point out something here. There is a relationship that goes on between a bonding process that goes on between a mother and sons that is totally different to a father and son. And there is a relationship of bonding that goes on uh, between a father and daughter that is totally different to a mother and daughter. Now, I couldn't understand that on still, until I lived through it. I have two sons and one daughter. The daughter came last long after the two sons and i used to read about this stuff and didn't understand it but when my daughter was born and that bonding process occurred over the years then i realized that there is a difference so understand so children need both parents to grow up with in a normal manner now some single parent may be listening to me now I may be saying, well, so or pastor, we are saying that we as single parents can't bring up children. Yes, you can bring them up. With the help of God, please pray and bring them up to the best of your ability. But your job, your task would have been better if there was a father in the life of that child. I want us to understand that. I want us to understand that. Uh, now, uh, let me close. Uh, let me close by pointing out something here. You know, the the life of a child from zero, from zero years on to seven years, the early years in a child's life. They are extremely important. And parents, please pay keen attention to what I'm saying. The early years are extremely important. And that is why you have to bear in mind, please understand, that because the early years are important, you have to make sure that on a daily basis, from the time that child is born, make sure that you give the type of instructions that are needed. Now, children like a structured life. Uh, when you get up in the morning, if it's morning worship, 
if if it is religious songs if it is praying with them and studying with them uh, whatever uh, you you gotta make sure that you do it repetitively on a daily basis uh, then please understand that a child's brain is like a dry sponge yeah it's like a dry sponge just waiting to suck up whatever so if you put garbage in it's garbage you will get out if you put good stuff in biblical stuff things that uh, are of God's liking godly stuff that is what the child will reflect you must not expect that a child uh, will uh, let's say keep the commandments and you never taught them the commandments and taught them the importance of learning and keeping the commandments you must not think that a child will understand how not to steal when in front of of them you are stealing in whatever way so please understand that from zero on to three one author says another author says from zero right on to seven a child's character is formed please understand that a child's character is really formed from zero on to seven so those formative years uh, don't just depend on the teachers your parents you must spend quality time with these children uh, when they come home sometimes we're too busy with our gadget uh, we're too busy catching up on facebook and on the internet and on whatsapp no these little ones i call these children little ones they will grow up ask yourself how much quality time you would have spent with them they crave it they long for your company sometimes we think that children want fancy clothes and all these fancy cell phone and all of that what your child needs a lot is quality time with you i remember i remember clearly the years of my children growing up and there were some days we used to take this time out from school and many times it used to be thursday and when we have time out from school, uh, my children will know that that day they're not going to school. And we would load up food in the car trunk, right? Uh, jump in the vehicle, uh, drive for miles, go someplace, take a swim, have a day out, visit relatives, etc. Now that my children are older, those are the things that they reflect on. I remember distinctly one time we were driving up the Linden Suzdike Highway, and when you're driving up this highway, uh, there are some little sand hills at the side. My children would say, Daddy, stop, stop, stop the car. I have to pull aside, stop the car. And they go on that uh, sand hill and roll down and enjoy themselves, then come back in the vehicle, and then we continue. Those are the things that my children remember. They remember also when we play cricket together, just the family playing cricket, right? They remember all of those things. So I am saying today that these little ones, our children, they will grow up. And you have to remember parents and guardians. Please remember, you have to know how to treat them well. You have to make that correct impression upon their minds, upon the memory bank of the minds so that later on in life they can reflect as to how you treated them and let me let me just say here you know children can learn anything you want to teach them yeah children can learn anything you emphasize and I, I remember distinctly there was a child about three plus going on to four the child uh, was taught Matthew 24 the entire chapter and the child stood up and repeated it. Some of the words the child could even say well, but the child repeated it. Uh, you must understand that your home environment, as you prepare it, it should be a place of learning. And remember that they prefer to copy what they see and imitate what they see than to do what you say to them. And so in closing today, parents, guardians, God, has given you children remember children are a heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward please remember that it is your responsibility to create the environment the amicable environment it is your responsibility to train your child well so that later on in life 
they will have an opportunity to take their rightful place in society and they will make you proud and they will make uh, many individuals proud. Also, uh, when they take their rightful place in society, if you have trained them well, please remember that they will be getting a chance to build up the kingdom of God and to pull down the kingdom of Satan. May God richly bless you parents as we cherish those little ones that are in our care. Let me pray. Dear God and Father, I thank you ever so much for an opportunity to present. I thank you for the children that you put into our care and keeping, some of us as teachers, some of us as parents, as significant others. Let us know on a daily basis, God, that you are counting on us as parents and grandparents and guardians to set the right example so that as these children follow us, they would be doing the right thing. Father, I single out a single parent who is listening today. Help them to know that you, God, you are still their help and you still care about them. Help give them the wisdom necessary so that this single parent uh, would be able to depend upon you, O oh God, and to do their best to grow up their child in the fear and admonition of the Lord. May God bless the children and the parents and the teachers, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Help me shine a light to a darkened world And always live the truth in